Romans. Um, I have the wonderful encouragement of my wife. I picked up this book. It's called The Shepherd's Global Classroom. And they have compiled, and there's right now I think they're approaching, looks like there's um, at least 20 here, but close, to, well over 20 different studies to be utilized actually on the mission field to train pastors and church leaders. And they cover a lot of different territory. And I would like to use this, we'd like to use this as the basis for messages for some time now. We want to go through Romans. And as I learned um, this past week, Romans has probably the clearest pattern of salvation of any of the epistles. And it's, it's a pattern that is actually... Um, similar to that which is given in the Old Testament. We think of the Old Testament law <clears throat> and that the New Testament is the time of grace. The reality is grace was alive and fully well in the Old Testament toward those that believed then. Grace toward Israel, the nation of Israel. Grace toward those, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the list that I started to mentioned earlier, the great cloud of witnesses. And so uh, we're going to trust to, to learn a lot as we go through this. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm going to be using this as my uh, springboard and then adding as I feel that I should. But let us stand for a moment and I would like for us to read <clears throat> Romans 1 and there's just a, a short section here in Romans 1 and then in chapter 15 and it's the purpose of the, the letter written by Paul to Rome Verses 11 through 15, and then we'll go to chapter 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul's writing. He's not been there, but he longs. For I long to see you. Excuse me. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led or hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. In chapter 15. 24, um, verse 23 before. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you on my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Jesus, we pray that you would uh, teach us, instruct us through your word, through the truth of the gospel of Christ. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Romans is, um, is a book of debated issues. Many theological issues have been debated in the church through the centuries. The book of Romans deals with controversial issues of theology perhaps more than any other book of the Bible. 
Here are some examples of questions answered in this letter. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to, to read the question, and I'd like for a few people to just speak up now. Um, either you speak loudly, or we're going to shove a microphone in your mouth, okay? If you have the answer, <coughs> it's your choice. <laughs> if you don't speak up the one time, then we may have you repeat it with the microphone in your hand, all right? So don't be bashful. We're all in here. This kind of a, it's a, more of a Bible study type setting as we want to learn why Paul wrote this letter to them. Uh, what does a person believe in in order to be saved by faith? What does a person believe in in order to be saved by faith? Jesus Christ. What does it mean that a Christian does not work for his salvation? It's a gift freely given to us, right. There's an, there'd be another answer for that concerning works themselves. Jesus does the work. There's still another one concerning works in us. Right, yeah, we can't do enough to, to earn salvation. Yeah, our righteousness is what we consider the best we can do is as filthy rags before God. Whew, that puts us way down there, okay? Did God decide to save some people and not to save others? No. Okay. How does God choose who is saved and who is not? Is there... What will happen to people who have never heard the gospel? Mm. Yeah, but what about those that have never heard over on the other side of the world? They've never even heard somebody talk about Jesus. They don't know his name. Hmm? Christians can go there, yes. That's good. And they should. That's correct. <clears throat> Right. To believe in that God. Right. Yes. And I believe that that desire to worship something was put in there to creation by God. Uh, it's that we all have this vacuum. We need to worship God to be complete in some manner. <coughs> That's good. How can God be just if he forgives some sinners and punishes others? Hmm. Did you say that? How can God be just? Huh? Right. That's true. Is a believer still a sinner? Hmm. Anybody want to? <laughs> um, is it, now let me ask beyond that, in the no, but, does he expect us to sin? gives us the power not to sin. Very good. Does God still have a plan for Israel? Yes. Yes, he does. All right. Paul did not write the letter to the Romans with the purpose of creating questions that would be debated for centuries. Let's consider how it happened that this letter was written. And we just went through this a moment ago. <clears throat> Paul let me go back through this again. We 1, 11 through 15. For I long to see you. Oh, let me ask the question, then I'll go through here. What reasons did Paul give for wanting to go to Rome? For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. 
that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of me and you so well, what's in that one and if you would if you have your Bible you can always look at it and see read it right there in front of you that'll be helpful I'll, I'll encourage you at this point to be bringing your Bibles <laughs> so that you can follow along in it um, I don't have anything necessarily against the electronic but unless you can write notes on it to save them it's good to have the Bible so you can mark it up so you can come back later and say oh that's what that means right Dick? <laughs> written little notes in the side okay <clears throat> that I may impart to you some spiritual gift he wants the, the believers to be encouraged now in verse 15 so as much as is in me I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also so what's his reason there what's, what does he want to do preach what the gospel, good news. Preach the gospel, the good news. And when I read that in chapter 15, verse 24, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward. So what is he saying there? What does he want to happen in Rome? with the Romans is he just going to walk past there th through there and wave at him say, uh, maybe shake hands walks past the church and heads on his way to Spain what's that yes and there's a sense here to be helped thitherward <clears throat> well that means uh, brought on my way thitherward by you uh, he says I would like for you to maybe even assist me to help me get over to, to Spain. Paul has spent the years A.D. 47 through 57 evangelizing territories around the Aegean Sea. He wrote the letters to the Romans in A.D. 57. He planned to make a trip to Jerusalem, then to Rome. Planned, uh, Paul planned to use the church at Rome as a base for launching a mission effort into Spain because he was sent out of Antioch um, which one was that? Was it Syrian Antioch which is north of Jerusalem there are little ways on the Mediterranean he was sent out of um, Antioch on his missionary journeys and um, the uh, the desire then so he's wanting another base here clear over in the west because he would often come back to Antioch share with them what went on and they would send him out again <clears throat> um, Rome was the oldest Roman colony in the west or Spain was the oldest Roman colony in the west and the center of Roman civilization in that part of the world now since Paul had never been to Rome the letter served as a personal introduction and preparation for his visit. That is probably the reason for the extensive greetings in chapter 16. When you go there, you see him say, greeting this person and that person, and he names a whole bunch of people there. I don't know how many it is, but it's quite a few. Paul's visit to Rome did not happen the way he planned. He was arrested in Jerusalem on false charges. When it seemed to him that he would not get justice, he appealed to Caesar, and being a, a Roman citizen, they were obliged to give him audience to Caesar. Had he not been a Roman citizen, had he been just a f Jew out of uh, Israel, out of Judea, he wouldn't have had that privilege. But he's a Roman citizen. Appeals to Caesar, okay, you're going to Caesar. After a dangerous journey, which included a shipwreck, he arrived in Rome as a prisoner in A.D. 60. I need some people to look up these two verses. Uh, somebody go to Acts 28. Okay, Hannah, this verse is 30 and 31. And then I need a Philippians 1.12. Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> Though he was confined, 
he was free to receive visitors and minister to them, minister to them and through them. Acts 28, 30 and 31, which is the last two verses before Romans. So at least he made it to Rome and he was able to minister beyond even the church. He met the church there, and um, but ministering to many Jews. Paul said that the events were working out for the advancement of the gospel. Uh, Philippians 1.12 things work together for good to those that love God and called according to his purpose. All these things that fell out to him, uh, being arrested in Jerusalem, going through, uh, uh, being in a sense uh, committing himself unto the Roman army for his protection and uh, the shipwreck and all of this, he says it's turned out, and, and here being closed in, uh, house arrest in Rome, it's turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So it worked out for God's glory. So there's, there's two ways that we're going to bring glory to God. <clears throat> to remain faithful in Him, to obey Him, and go where He wants to go. Then His purposes can be accomplished. And the second is being faithful when things don't go well. When things go wrong and things come against us. If we remain faithful in there to the Lord, He will turn it for good. And for the sake of His kingdom. So we see... Uh, both of thing, those things that work in Paul's life. Now, some historians believe that Paul was released after two years. Whether or not he made his trip to Spain is unknown. We know that he was eventually executed in Rome, but that may have been a second visit, actually, back to, to Rome. We just don't know that. We don't have any, uh, this kind of rest in tradition, but we don't have any documents that speaks that. By explaining the theology of salvation, to show the basis of his missionary work, Paul showed the basis of missionary work in all places and times. So it wasn't just a fact that he was living out this missionary work, uh, bringing the theology of, of salvation, the gospel of Christ, by his doing it and explaining it, it becomes clear that it's for all of us in all places and all times that we are to carry the gospel. We are to share of Christ what he's done for us. Several questions arise naturally uh, in response to Paul's request that they might launch his missionary trip. Someone might ask, why should you be the one to go? So Paul began the letter by mentioning his dedication to the work of evangelism. And that's in 1-1. In so if somebody would stand and read Romans 1-1 one, one, boldly, loudly. <clears throat> Dick, you're on. I see you're looking around. Oh, this is Romans 1. I think you were... All right. We'll let you find it. <clears throat> That's also a good place where he talks about the <laughs> call of God. Set apart for the gospel of God. Thank you. He later explained his special calling and success as apostle to the Gentiles. Somebody read uh, Romans 15. Somebody go there. Romans 15. And start with verse 15. Got it, Ariana? Okay, you want to stand up and read 15 to 20. 15 to 20.
uh, Illyricum. He's, he's giving some spiritual credentials to help put them at rest, saying, I, <clears throat> by the grace of God within me, I have shown that my call as an apostle to preach the gospel is from God himself. And I think there's a place that we can do that if we have been living faithfully and our life has shown those evidences of God at work in us God um, fulfilling his purposes through us. There are times when we can step back in humility and say, listen, this is what God has done through me. The call is real. And so he wants them to be able to receive his thoughts, his words, uh, because he's never met them. Um, and so, you know, we don't want just anybody writing our church and saying, I've got a message for you, and we go, oh yeah, we don't know who this guy is, but we'll just, we'll just do whatever he says. No. Because he's given instruction. He's going to tell about the gospel. He's going to give some very specific instruction to the church there, and so he needs to make certain they know that it's a safe person that's writing this letter to them. Now someone might ask, why does everyone need to hear the gospel? Maybe this message is not needed everywhere. But Paul explained the potential of the gospel for mankind worldwide. So I need somebody to go in, in chapter 1, Romans 1, verses 14 and 16, and then somebody go to chapter 10, and I'll give you the verse, verses there in a moment. Romans 1, 14. Okay, who's going to do that one? Yes. Thank you. So he's saying that this gospel is for all people. Um, and we'll, we'll go into those words here a little bit later. Somebody have Romans 10, verse 12. Who's got that? Someone? Karen? So stay right there for a moment, and I'm going to have you do 14 and 15. So he's got, Paul explained the potential of the gospel for mankind worldwide and the urgency of missionary work. So it's 14 15. So the necessity uh, of someone going. As Andrew's trying to, to teach us in the missions encounter, there needs to be somebody that goes to share the gospel. Uh, they need it because they're not saved. They don't know Christ. And so they need to hear his name. They need to know that Christ is the Son of God who came to earth and died for them. And so there has to be somebody to go. Um, he showed that the message applies to every person in the world and that every person desperately needs to hear it. And it also says that there are those that he has called to go beyond our borders to do that. Let's look at the first passage. Paul's greetings and introduction to the theme. And that's verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> and I would like for um, Scott, could I get you to, to read those? Stand and read those 1 through 17. Romans 1, yeah.
Thank you. <clears throat> Romans 1, 1 through 17 describes Paul's call and motivation to spread the gospel. After that, 1, 18 through 320 explains why the gospel is necessary because sinners are under the wrath of God. However, 1, 15 through 19 forms a transition between these sections. It makes a point in itself expressing the gospel concisely that sinners are guilty because they know better and are therefore under wrath, but the believer is saved. And the two more verses. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God hath showed it unto them. And that's was Sister Dorothy was sh sharing a moment ago that all people have some revelation of God in their midst. <clears throat> I want to diverge here a little bit and kind of give you an idea, to, a greater uh, picture. And I wish I had this large, but you can maybe see this here. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. It's a picture of uh, a wolf and uh, a mother wolf and Romulus and Remus two twin boys that were orphaned and this wolf nurses them and they grow up and uh, they build a city and they somehow, as the gods always do, one killed the other, uh, Romulus killed Remus and that was where they got the name for Rome. Rome was full of idols and idolatry and <clears throat> Paul lived in an age when idolatry was very evident because you had an idol, you had some figure that people bowed down to, they offered sacrifice, would bring food to, you know, to offer to it, and they would do all kinds of oblations and things to rituals to satisfy the gods. So part of, of um, time, or things going on then, I want us to understand that it, it's from the very beginning. And one of the things that was pointed out to us, when we look at the Ten Commandments, um, the first command, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's kind of preamble there. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This idea of bringing gods before God is something that has happened since the very beginning of time. And, um, and, and I just a, a week or so ago, it hit me, this particular scripture, and it's where we get uh, on the insignia on our sign over there, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's from Joshua 24. Well, as I was reading this the other day, I was just hit with this, this thought here. I've never seen this. <clears throat> and uh, Joshua 24, 15 and 16, or actually... Uh, 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And let me go back to Exodus 20 again because there's, there's more of that. It's not just to not have any gods before you, but thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or is in water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. I, the Lord, thy God, is my jealous God. Now, in the Hebrew, Dr. Oswald said, says, don't make any image of me. Don't make any image of me and patterning it after some created thing. So we're not supposed to have any other God because he's one God. That means that he is, there's, he's not, or how is it? One means that he's complete. It's not combined with anything else. He's pure. He's holy one. And to bring on anything else onto the scene is to lessen who he is. So that's the background of this. So here, here is um, Joshua saying, Now serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. And I thought, I never thought that before. That your fathers served in the other side of the flood. Um, let's see, let me get this right here. Uh, and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And I had never realized that it was so clear that Joshua was saying, no, hold it. He's, he's not that far away from the flood. It's, it's there in scriptures. And you know that Joshua was to study the word of God daily in the tabernacle. He was, he was Moses' uh, right-hand man, but he stayed in the tabernacle uh, studying the word of God, the Torah, or the, the beginning thing. So what was given... Uh, at the beginning, Joshua was to know those things. So he knew that the fathers of the Israelites were idolaters before the flood. They had idols. They had things that God did not want to happen, but that would just happen. So how did that happen? I guess the question is, how did that happen for them? Well, if we go back to the beginning, Satan's deception <clears throat> began with Eve saying, did God really say? Did God really mean what he said and so it was putting a question mark in our sincerity in worshiping and believing in God <clears throat> out of that this, uh, part of Satan's deception through all of time is to take what sh that which was designated to God bring you some of the truth of it some of the rituals some of the patterns maybe even some of the words but put a little twist in here and cause man to doubt God in doing it. He's making a mockery of it. Now, what is a mock? If you make a mock-up of something, well, you're trying to create something that looks like something else. There's a refrigerator back there. So if you want to make a mock-up of a refrigerator, you would take some white material or maybe a lot of wood and some metal and stuff, and you would create this thing, and you would paint it white and black and maybe have some chrome paint and make it look like it's a mock-up. But it's not the real thing. Satan, from the very beginning, has always created a mock-up to mock God. That's one of his things. And if you want to know what's going on in a lot of churches today and some movements, it's a mockery of God. Because <clears throat> as he pointed out, he said, uh, how is it? To take the name of the Lord God in vain is to lessen. I've got it here in the notebook. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, speak of something other than him without being him. Or, it's, no, it's a mystic. It has a mystical, uh, magical use. Um, <clears throat> Using the name of Jesus, uh, Oswald said, that we have the power of attorney in the name of Jesus. Okay? In the name of Jesus, we can pray, and God will heal, God will deliver, God will do great things, and he will supply our needs. In the name of Jesus, but if we begin to use it as kind of the, the genie in the bottle, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I, I need a new car. Uh, I would like uh, Mercedes Benz. In the name of Jesus, Father, I claim a new Mercedes Benz. It's using his name in a magical way that has taken his name in vain. He is to remain God and sovereign in all things. We are to come under his authority as Lord. <clears throat> so all of this is happening, and Satan at the very beginning began to take man, veer us away, and begin to make all things a mockery. So one of the things he did was, well, let's take what God created, that which is both man and animals, and let's create a God that is in our likeness or in the likeness of these animals that we can have some degree of control over. That we can control them. That's why in Isaiah God says, the man takes the block of wood, he cuts it in two. And with one he takes it and he carves out an idol and he sets it up and the other piece he throws in the fire to keep himself warm. Well you see the absurdity of that. It's the same block of wood. So did he find the holy part of the wood, the divine part of the wood? I hope he didn't get it mixed up and burn the divine part and put up the non-divine part up on the shelf. But God so works and deceives my, man, you and I, into believing such stuff like that. That we can name and claim something and God's just going to give it to us because somehow we have the, the, uh, the authority in Jesus Christ that we can just claim whatever we want. It's clear in scripture that we need to pray prayers that are according to his will. 
and not what we want. <clears throat> so we have this, this thing going on at the very beginning, and idolatry was widespread then, before even the flood. And they brought it, now this is very interesting, <clears throat> somehow it made it onto the ark, and came through the ark, and it's picked up again. Now, this is my this is my initial, just momentary interpretation of that. Is that it was not there by God's grace? They were a righteous people. The eight that were on the ark, God delivered them. But as man began to spread out again, Satan was there to begin to twist things and begin to make a mockery again, because that's what he he's best at doing. And so. It was before they worshipped idols before and they worshipped idols afterwards. I want to kind of <clears throat> close up the thought here. Maybe just be, just finish right here. And we'll pick up from here next week. And what is the point that I want to make unto you? We need to believe in God's word and know that there is an arch enemy of God. He's not as great as God. He's a created being. But his, his deceptive powers is far greater than our human mind in itself can, can battle. We cannot battle Satan. We have to come in the name of Christ. We have to come with the wisdom of Christ, uh, the knowledge that God will give us to, to battle Satan because he will turn our hearts away from God and he will get us worshiping things or, or focusing on things in this life. <clears throat> Could be material things that will begin to catch our, our heart and our mind and our thoughts and will begin to attend to those things and desire those things and it will draw us away from God. Maybe it's our, our time that we have. Uh, one of the things that was pointed out is that God gave us seven days, or he gave us one day to find out what we believed about seven days. One day to worship him. Will we set aside that day to worship and give wholeheartedly that day? Do we, um, do we believe that he gave us seven days just for ourselves, or uh, that there is a day that should be set aside in love for him? He gave us the tithe so that we would know uh, what we believe about the, the 100% is what we believe about the 10%. If the 100% belongs to God, then we'll willingly give 10% if that's all he requires. I may have mentioned that the other way. What we believe about seven days is determined by what we believe about one day, the Sabbath. And so there's those things. Our, our job can become an idol to us that we focus on that and it begins to move us away from that the pure uh, love and joy of the kingdom of God um, so we have to be careful and we have to have our uh, open in our heart and our time of devotions in the morning usually that's the best time if it's not possible it's, to do in the morning sometime in the day we need to focus on him we need to be saying Lord is my heart pure towards you is there anything standing between me and yourself and if there is it's going to hinder our fellowship and that's, the reality is the kingdom of God is all about fellowshipping with God and if our fellowship is not pure our obedience is not going to be pure and we're going to be grieving the spirit of God and the more we remain in that state of affairs Satan going to be jumping for joy and the less we'll be able to really be in God's will. That's Satan's work. That's what he's, he was not designed to do that, but he's a liar, he's a deceiver and he's going to try to work that in our lives. So, what I want you to take with you this week <coughs> is that God has called us to live pure lives, to worship him alone, and not have any idols in between, no idols in the heart. And understand that Satan can create it this afternoon. He can create it tomorrow in your life if you're not careful. To keep your focus on Christ, your heart filled with praise, uh, a heart filled with prayer as well. Whatever situation comes up, we go to him in prayer. 
put him in praise. As we're faithful to do that, God will keep us. He will keep us. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We're thankful <clears throat> that you sent Paul into that idolatrous word with, world with the, the word of the gospel of truth. And that through that word, the power of your spirit brought many sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. That you delivered them from their idolatry. You helped them to see the, the, the deception of Satan in their lives. And brought to them a place of peace and rest with you, Lord God. May you help us this week to be focused on that which is true and holy and pure and right of a good report. Uh, Lord God, that we might keep our hearts and our minds clean, that we might be a blessing to you, a pleasure to you, Lord Jesus, this week. And if there might be, Lord God, in any place in our hearts, a place where a little idol has been set up, something that we cherish in some manner before you, it could even be a family member or family, Lord, that we've placed it before you. We want to confess it, get it uh, under the blood of Jesus, and make you Lord and Sovereign completely in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.